Have you ever wondered if the advice you're getting on how to be a great leader, a great employee, and a person who really makes a difference is correct? That's what we'll talk about today. It had long since come to my attention that the people of accomplishment rarely sat back and let things happen to them. They went out and happened to things. Leonardo da Vinci. Today, we're going to review the third part of our series on the book, Barking Up the Wrong Tree by Eric Barker. And he's an interesting guy who provides a lot of research and a lot of ideas about how to do things the best possible way. Now we're going to cover some more ideas about whether certain aspects of your personality can make you a great leader or put you behind. His next question is, is do quitters win or do winners never quit? It's always an interesting topic because there is a certain amount of stick to that makes us better, that makes us thrive in something that we found difficult to do. But there's also something to be said about people who quit the things that aren't very good for them or aren't going to produce the results they're hoping to get. He says that we understand from Angela Duckworth that grit matters and sticking to things that are hard really produces great success. And he asks the question, why don't we do it? Why don't we stick to the things that really make the most impact in our lives? And he says that even then, sometimes quitting is also the smartest choice. And how can we figure out which is the right take each time? And in the big five personality test, this is another trait that has to do with optimism. He says that a lot of this about whether we stick to something or we don't stick to something has to do with whether we're optimistic. And in general, optimism is good for us, it's good for people around us, and it seems to make us luckier. Positive thinking, in the end, creates more opportunities for people. But he says that for those of you who are not optimistic, don't worry, there are some advantages to being a pessimist too. Sometimes you have that critical eye, you're able to discern what really matters and doesn't matter. And he says that the good thing is, is that this is not a trait about genetics. This is about the stories we tell ourselves in the world. So if you find yourself on the wrong side of optimism and pessimism, it can be changed. He says that there's a lot of people in this world that work really hard. He mentions mothers, soldiers, all who do things that require a great deal from them, require a great deal of their efforts, their time, even to the point of pain, and they don't give up. And the reason for that is the story they're telling themselves is that these things must be done. And that helps them stick to it and keep going when things look really down. Says that if we have something greater than ourselves, a story about what is outside of ourselves, he says then we have what Viktor Frankl says, what is to give life must endure burning. Meaning the things that really matter will burn, but they'll come out of it even stronger. We don't give up. Daniel Kahneman, who got a Nobel Peace Prize for his work on cognition, he's one of those big names out there in the world of psychology, says that we are actually more wired to hate losing than to gaining. It is more painful for us to lose a dollar, he says, than it is to earn a dollar or gain a dollar. We feel worse about the lost dollar. And so a lot of times the story we're telling ourselves is about how to avoid pain and not really gain success. And he says it's because that in the end, too much losing would often mean that we're removed from a tribe or that our lives are threatened and that that's not really what is important for us. And he says that, you know, when we're in the workplace itself, we like to be good at our job. Our job wants us to be good at our job. But you know what? He says it's dull, it's boring. And that actually... A game where you have an 80% failure rate inspires us to keep going. It makes it more exciting. And he said that zero failure means zero fun. And that makes a lot of sense. And so we tend to stick to the things that we're very successful at doing, that we know we're going to win at. But it also makes for a very boring life. And we don't feel good about our results, even if we've succeeded all the time. He said that research shows that we tend to do what's easy, that we don't go after the things that are harder, but will make us happy and make us successful. And he says that you can tell this, but sometimes we get invited by friends and we don't feel like going out, even though we know we'll have fun. 
we're probably more likely to want to do the easy thing, which is to stay home and sit under a blankie than actually go out with our friends. See, we value easy over fun even. And we may crave all of that. We may desire life to be easy. We may desire rest and relaxation, but it actually is a sign that we're doing less, we're getting less, and we're not going to be happy and successful in our lives. And he says that we have to realize that every decision we make has a cost and a benefit. If we decide not to exercise, but instead work on your podcast, well, it's great because now you have that podcast done and it's ready to go. But what did you lose by not working out? There was a cost there. Your future health, your future weight, the stress relief the exercise did, even though you did what looked like to be the most productive thing, but you had a cost and you have to realize what the cost of everything is. And so he says, quote, quit does not have to be the opposite of grit, meaning that you don't have to stick to everything, nor do you have to quit everything. The idea is what he calls strategic quitting. We have to quit the right things. For example, once you find the thing you're passionate about, quitting the things that you're not so passionate about or the things that don't give you as much success or as much benefit to the things that you're doing are the things that you should be quitting. He says that if you're ever at that point where you just wish you had more time, the obvious answer is more quitting. To answer the big question, is it stick to that matters or quitting that matters? The answer is they both matter. And it matters that you do the right thing to the right item. He gives a quote from Peter Drucker, who got an invitation to do something. And Peter Drucker responded, I hope that you will not think me presumptuous or rude if I say that one of the secrets of productivity is to have a very big waste paper basket to take care of all the invitations such as yours. You have to say no, even if it hurts some feelings or you miss some minor opportunities to do something. He says that, quote, grit can't exist without quit that we know we have to stick to some things and some things are important that we stick to. They have long-term gain for us, but the things that don't, we have to quit. And in the end, to bring it back to the optimism versus pessimism, when we are more optimistic, we have more grit about something. If we think that something is gonna be more successful to us and we have a rosier outlook on that thing, we'll most likely stick to it. If we're pessimistic, about life in general or a particular task, we'll probably drop it. So he says that we should keep trying, keep trying new things, keep trying new ideas. And as we do it, we'll get luckier because eventually we'll hit on the thing that makes us more successful. He mentions an experiment that basically a group of people were given a bunch of dried noodles, some rope, some marshmallows, different things. And they were told to build the highest structure they could think of. And he said that out of engineers, managers, MBA students, it was the kindergartners who actually beat everybody. And why was that? They kept trying. They kept trying new ideas. And they just jumped right in and started working while people were planning and failing and analyzing it. The young kids were actually just jumping in, doing it and trying it and quickly learning from what did not work. That instant feedback loop made them successful. He gives us a term that's called the implementation intention. And he said that most of us just call that a plan. But basically, when we actually have that implementation intention, we're most likely to overcome the things that get in our way from getting our dreams. We will actually intend to do the things we want. You look at voter polls, they always say, well, here's what all the voters think. Oh, but here's what the likely voters think. Those are the people who have implementation intention. It's a different set of opinions than the people who just can vote. He gave a study by Peter Galwitzer and Veronica Brandstatter, and they found out that just by planning out some basic things like where and how something is going to get done, it made students 40 percent more likely that they're going to do the thing, that they're actually going to implement the idea. And then he said that the two magic words are if. And then, then. And that means if this bad thing happens, then I shall do this. I'm going to exercise. And if I come across a day where I don't feel like it, I will do this instead. 
and have a backup plan so that you know what to do when you come across a hurdle. Those two words make your implementation intentions much more likely that's going to happen. And having that basic plan in place will ensure that you get started. And that basically having dreams about things doesn't make any of those things happen. You actually have to have a plan in place to get your dreams, not just dream about your dreams. And you have to know what you're going to do when it gets hard. He says psychology professor Gabrielle Otigen, she calls it WHOOP. And WHOOP stands for Wish, Outcome, Obstacle, Plan. It's basically talking about the things that we were just mentioning and putting it together in an acronym. How are you going to get from your wish to lose weight to the outcome of losing weight? What are your obstacles? And then what's your plan when you hit those obstacles? That's what's going to help you get the things that you really want. So it's not really about quit or grit. It's about the goal, the plan, and what do you do in the hurdles? And he said that in the end, we also have to have a realistic goal. You can say that your goal is to be in the NFL. You're probably not going to get that goal unless you're one of those very special people. You might have the goal of being the next tech billionaire, but chances are you're probably not going to do that unless you're a very special individual. Can you make your plan more realistic, more based on the things that you're good at, and that way you'll know that you'll have more energy to get it done and actually get your goal with less disappointment because your goal was set too high. He says, try out little experiments, try little bets. I bet that I can get myself a resume in the next week. I bet that I can apply for five jobs in the next week. Little tiny bets, little tiny experiments will move us that much ahead. His next chapter was on the question about whether or not it's what you know versus who you know. Does knowing other people get us more ahead than actually being smart or capable in this world? And he says that, first of all, you have to understand it's about knowing how to be a friend. It's not about introversion. It's not about extroversion. It's about being a good friend, being someone who helps other people. and that. You also know people who are super connectors. Those are people who know the really important people and can give you introductions to other people who can help you get your dreams. So while it is important to know your stuff, it is still also important to know people. And he said that one of the things that you could do is to make sure that, first of all, you make time for other people. And then once you've met them, follow up with them. If they've asked you for something, if they asked you a question, make sure you answer the question. And then once you have those other people in your life, learn from them. Make sure that if they're either an official mentor or an unofficial mentor, you really take the time, learn the things that they know, get in deep with them, get an understanding of a relationship. First of all, it'll help you learn. But second, it might help you learn what you don't want. There have been times where I used to think I'd want a particular occupation. And then when I actually talked to people in that occupation, I learned that I really didn't want that. And sometimes the benefit of having a mentor is even just telling you what you don't want. And it's always important to listen, but also contribute to the relationship. He says, help them think, help them understand something clearly and help them to know who you really are. Because if those opportunities do come up, and you are a perfect fit for that situation, they'll be able to help you even further. He wonders too, in the next chapter, about whether you have to believe in yourself. What if you have low self-confidence and you really don't think a lot of yourself? And maybe you just think you're not worthwhile. Maybe you think that you can't do that. Or you think you're amazing. Or instead of admitting when you made a mistake, you blame other people. And you take credit for every good thing. He says that low self-confidence is just as delusional as being arrogant. You're not really being humble in that same way when you have low self-confidence. You should have the proper amount of self-confidence. I have some self-confidence in my technical abilities. I have low self-confidence in my athletic abilities. It's not about me being a low-confidence person or an arrogant person. It's about me knowing me and knowing when I know something really well, 
or I don't. But it's important that we're humble, that we don't act like a jerk to everyone else around us, that we don't take credit for other people's work. He said that when people were even forced to be humble, even if they didn't feel like they should be humble, it actually helped build better teams, build better relationships with other people in the team, and made the work go better for everybody. And he could say that this is about being positive versus negative. That when you are a high confidence person, sometimes it makes that person seem like they're being more negative. They're critical to everyone around them. But that's because sometimes they have a really good eye for finding faults. And you shouldn't really take that as a negative emotion or a way of dropping your confidence because someone was negative around you. At times, they're pointing out an important trait that you need to see. He says that when it comes to being arrogant or low confidence, that if you get an A on your test, great. I got an A, I'm happy. But when you get an F on a test, suddenly that makes you drive to figure out what went wrong. How can I do better the next time? So having confidence or a lack of confidence isn't as important as knowing where bad things are happening, finding out how to motivate ourselves to do something better. He says in the end that it's important that we forgive ourselves for when things go bad, that we learn whatever we're going to learn about something and get over it. And that confidence should be a matter of earning it, of learning something and knowing that we did a great job of it. And now we built confidence in it. When you have fake confidence, when you're a fake overconfident person, it comes out and it really ends up burning bridges with people. And so having that right level of confidence built on your history of accomplishments will get you so much farther in your life than being fake, arrogant, or a jerk. Find that right level. His next question is talking about work-life balance. Does it matter that we work really hard to become successful? And he says, you know what? It does really matter that we work hard. And in fact, some of the people who are the best at things in the entire planet are there because they worked hard. When you think about Olympians, how hard they work for a two-minute race, or all the people who became chess masters, the top of business industry, you realize how much effort it takes to really be the best of the best. And honestly, that's why a lot of people, CEOs at the top, the people who are leaders of industry, get paid so much money because they strive so hard to become that important voice, that important vision. It wasn't just granted to them through good luck or being charming. People actually work really hard for those things to be important leaders. He said that if you look at all the professional jobs in the world, that quote, the top 10% of the workers produce 80% more than the average and 700% more than the bottom 10% of the company. So it's important to realize that there are people out there who make a huge impact in everything they do. And then there's a lot of people who kind of slog behind and don't really accomplish much. To be that top performer takes work. It requires hours. And in order to do that, we're going to need all the energy and oomph we can get. It means doing all the things that make you energetic. Is that eating right? Is that exercise? Whatever you need to do to get to that pinnacle of effort, you're going to have to try to get there. But he said that there's a downside to it too. Of course, if you are working all the time, it's probably going to make you unhappy. And even if you're just plugging away at the hours, if even if you're just doing everything that you can to get something done, if you are not using that time efficiently, if you aren't good at telling what requires you to work that hard, And what doesn't need to be worked at that hard, you're going to be doing a lot of work that you don't need to be doing. You have to be smarter about it. You have to be able to push yourself with the right projects, with the right things. Being smarter helps because it pushes us into being able to spend our time more efficiently, but it's not everything. It's that combination of smarts and hard work. And that in the end, we're not computers. We can't go time in and time out and work 100% of the time. We need rest. And when I joined my company, I left a company that I mentioned before. It was causing me to work over 100 hours a week. 
I was burned out. I was tired. I'm not even sure that I was even getting more done than I would have if I worked half the time. Because if I worked half the time, I would be more effective. I would work more rapidly. I would probably think smarter about what I was doing. And when I went to my next company, they were very insistent on the fact that I needed to be fresh. I needed to have good thoughts. And that means I needed to have a life. I needed to be able to rest. And I needed to be able to do all the things in my life that made me a better human being, a better thinker. And that meant getting vacations, having rest time, getting enough sleep, and being with the people that you love. And I appreciated the fact that they thought that was important. He mentions a quote from George Bernard Shaw, who in the end was not a very good human being. And he said this quote says, the true artist will let his wife starve, his children go barefoot, his mother drudge for a living at 70, sooner than work on anything else but his art. Wow, that is really horrible. And it's a horrible way to be a person. Maybe it makes you a better artist or a better CEO or better whatever it is that you're trying to do. But without having that whole human experience, I think in the end, it doesn't make you better at those things. George Bernard Shaw is remembered as a great playwright, but I'll tell you, he's never remembered as a great human. And that's important too. So he said the important thing that you need to do is that first of all, don't create to-do lists. Instead, schedule tasks. That means you go to whatever calendar it is you're using, whether it's digital or on paper, and you don't say, I need to write this blog article. You schedule it. You actually put it on your calendar. It's more important that it's on your calendar than you have it on a list. Says it's important that we also have this expectation from our company, from our boss, about what it is we're supposed to be doing, how many hours we're supposed to be working. If we have a mismatch in that expectation, it's going to either cause us to work more than we're supposed to work, or we're going to be disappointing to our boss and our company all the time. And maybe when you find out what that expectation is, you'll find out that maybe this company isn't for you. Or you'll find out that this is the perfect company for me because they expect me to have a balanced life. But you need to know that answer. And then once you know what that expectation of time is, make sure that you commit to ending your time exactly at that moment. Plan your day so that if you are going to close up shop at five o'clock, you do that because you are a human being that has other needs than just working. And so Cal Newport, who writes a lot of really great book, recommends that you have a shutdown ritual, which means you do the same thing at the end of the day that says, my day of work is done. Especially if you got caught up at working at home during the pandemic, maybe you're still working from home. You might find that your day just kind of blurs into each other, that you don't really know where the day begins or the day ends. I read about people during the pandemic who would get in their car and drive around the block clockwise to go to work, quote marks. They were just going back home. And then at the end of their day, they'd get into their car and they would drive counterclockwise around the block to indicate their time was done. I didn't really do anything like that, but I did have this ritual that the first thing I would do would be to eat dinner. That was my shutdown. And then I would tell my friends that my day is done. So I did have a ritual, but it didn't involve driving. But I think that if you need something more visual, that's a great way to go. And he says that writing things down at the end of your day, the end of your workday, about the things that you need to get done the next day will help your brain settle. You won't spend the whole night thinking, oh, you know, tomorrow I should really get that thing done. If it's written down, then you will feel it's off your plate and you'll be able to more fully relax when you're done with your work. I find that to be true. And that's what I do at the end of every day. I write down the most important things I need to do tomorrow. And our fun entertainment quote of the day comes from The Imitation Game. They only beat me up because I'm smarter than they are. No, they beat you up because you're different. Mother says I'm just an old duck. And she's right. But, you know, Alan, sometimes it's the very people who no one imagines anything of who do the things no one can imagine. That's right. Sometimes it's not the people who can imagine anything. 
It's sometimes the people who can imagine things the rest of us can't even imagine. Makes me think of Steve Jobs. Who would have ever thought we would have had these phones and we'd be walking around with our entire music collection, our entire movie collection, all of our notes, all of our works in our pockets. He did, and he made it happen. Okay, everyone. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a fantastic week.